Amen. Amen. Hello, Deacon Rodriguez is in the house. How you doing? How you doing? God bless you. God bless you. Now, I know that my selection of music is a bit old school right now, but that's okay. I like, um, I love it. I like um, to have a different variety of songs. <laughs> that's right. I love, I love um, Lee Williams and the Spiritual QCs. I have a very vast um, um, taste in music. Um, not only in the gospel world, but also in different genres of music. All right. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we bless you. We thank you, Lord God, for your peace. We thank you, Lord God, for allowing for us to be able to just come together once again. I ask you, Lord God, to touch these, your people. I ask you, Lord God, to bring knowledge, wisdom, and understanding to the hearer. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And amen. Again, everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. As we go through our next topic, which is part 1B, will you be ready when Jesus comes? When will you be ready when Jesus comes? Just as a couple of housekeeping notes before we get into the teaching on tonight. First of all, um, we would like to invite you to worship with us at Divine Truth Christian Center. We're located at 425 North Park Street in the beautiful city of Apopka, Florida. We're meeting at the Apopka Memorial Middle School. And we would like to, again, extend that invitation to you all to come worship with us every Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. Again, that's every Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. AM. We are replanning our ministry in the area that God has led us to, and uh, we are looking forward to meeting the people of the city of Apopka as well. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. As I move around my portable light right here, right, let's go ahead and follow the light as we get into tonight's teaching. So let's go ahead and uh, put Lee Williams and fade him into the background, and don't worry, he'll be back a little bit later on this evening. So where we left off of on the last couple of um, days, um, and I'll just go ahead and show this on the screen, we were talking about what the signs were at the time that Noah was basically preaching to the people when destruction was getting ready to come upon them because of the evil acts. And remember, we talked about um, the reason why God was so harsh when it came to the flood at that time. And it really, um, I actually had a conversation with the individual and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later on. But at that time, there was a lot of things that were very similar to what was going on in our modern day as it relates to the signs of the times and how we should really um, know the seasons of the times, right? So we can look outside and we can see that the weather is changing, right? We can look outside and see that the leaves are browning just a little bit quicker, not quite just yet, as it would be in the next couple of months. But we know that there has been a shift in the atmosphere, especially after that storm um, that um, we experienced just a couple of weeks ago. So the atmosphere has changed and we could see that with our natural eyes and we could also feel it um, when it comes to the different types of temperatures that are, of course, out there. But as the verse says in Genesis 6, verse 1 and 2, just as a recap, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, they lusted after them, and they took them wives of all which they chose, which was basically um, a violation against the uh, things of God. And that was really kind of like one of the groups um, of angels, if you will, that willfully disobeyed God and what um, Jesus described. Um, you know how like, um, you know, years ago, um, I wouldn't say years ago, but in scripture where Jesus came to the man that was at uh, Genesaret, 
um, the individual legion, if you will. We talked about that this past Sunday and how when Jesus came into the presence of the man that was um, demonically possessed, they said, have you come to torment us before our time? Right. So those disembodied spirits that were inside of that specific man that Jesus actually delivered him from and spoke um, spoke deliverance to that man, named it and claimed what he was basically dealing with. And then he basically performed, if you will, exorcism, some people would say, or um, deliverance um, for that specific individual and cast those demons into the pigs. That's the reason why, um, even on a deeper level, pigs are not only unclean, but are seen as unclean, you know, just uh, from a food standpoint, but just all around because of where they specifically dwell, right? And so that doesn't mean that all pigs have demons, not a lot, not a lot but it's um, everything is intentional whenever God does it. And so that same swine-minded um, people, stubbornness, rebellion, witchcraft, those particular pigs went into the sea. But the really part that I want you to focus on is when they said, um, have you come to torment us before our time? Or when Paul was writing um, to um, individuals and it was talking about how, you know, he was talking about Abaddon and, and Hell and Gehenna and how there were still demons that were still um, um, bound in chains. But those demons that were bound in chains were the demons if you will, or the fallen angels, if you will, that disobeyed God during this particular time of the flood that was the um, precursor to all of the giants, Ishbabanab, Lakshmi, Goliath, King Og, all of those individuals or the Nephilim at that moment in time. Remember, there's Seraphim, there's Cherubim, there's Teraphim, and then there's Nephilim, all right? The Nephilim were the worst. That's where you get a lot of these legends of of men of renowned, grotesque um, beings that were a cross between um, disobedient angels or fallen angels or the fallen angels that were out there, and of course, humans. And that was one of the, and, and so um, as a result of that, they began to intermarry, do grotesque things, and it began to spread like wildfire on the earth. And those same individuals heard the message of Noah at that moment in time, which was repent. But they, of course, naturally they didn't because they were filled with lust. So just like um, angels have choices, humanity also has choices. So that's the reason why the flood really came is because the holy was with unholy. And so God was like, you know what? Instead of having to deal with all of this stuff, um, especially after 120 years of you guys kind of doing what you want. And and really the what was going across the line was not only humanity, but it was also people from his own courtroom that basically betrayed him and violated um, their duties as angelic beings, which are also supposed to be holy by um, giving into their own temptation, just like Satan did, and um, mating with the daughters of men. It sounds really interesting and all of that, but basically, basically, excuse me, basically it all goes back to um, disobedience and it all goes back to disobedience and not only disobedience by humanity, but also disobedience from those that claim to be in divinity. So do you know how like um, in scripture where it says that the preachers are held to a higher or stricter judgment? Just imagine, and we're human, just imagine what kind of um, standard that the angelic host has to meet. So that's why the punishment was so harsh. And of course, all those that indulge along with that, along with men as well. So... They took wives of all which they chose, which was against God. So that was as the days of Noah. So going back to the scripture to kind of finish up and wrap up what we're talking on today, let's go ahead and go to the rest of it. So again, they rejected the message of God. And we see what happened as repeated in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. They spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood. The world of the ungodly. So Noah had a really small church at that time, <laughs> and 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 what it is is that he was going against the tide. Many there's many preachers of righteousness even in our current time that are going against the tide, the culture, if you will. And then of course the second uh, verse is First Peter chapter three verse twenty, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So just take you know there's 365 days in the year, right? So just take. 365 times 120. Somebody could just put that into uh, the chat, um, if you will. Just take 365 times 120 and put those number of days that God actually waited. 
Just look at that. Just in total. So you could just imagine somebody preaching the message and being patient in hopes that the people will receive the message as many as could before God judged the world, right? Okay, so that's a long time. So people always just wonder, yeah, that's a lot. 43,800 days, y'all. Man, you talk about a payment plan. That's that's a pay, payment plan, payment plan. So that's a long, 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 long time. Remember, it's 365 times 120 years. So 365 times 120 years. So that those are your numbers right there. All right. So it's either 7,300, 43,800. One of y'all. <laughs> One of y'all. Oh, okay. So so I think uh they I think they got the right numbers, Jose. Thank you, Sister Turner. Thank you, Sister Martin, for that. Either way, that's a long time. We talk about the grace of God. Imagine how many times God forgave and gave them second chances. That's a lot of chances. We talk about 70 times 70. Look at that. 70 times 70. Woo that, that's, that's a lot. That's 490 times in human terms. But yeah, no, no, don't worry about it. Either way, it's a long time. So it also goes on to say in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, repeating, when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So you talk about a small ministry, right? But again, remember, we're not talking about a, a flood that, is, that had billions of people on the planet. It was not a lot of people on the planet at that moment in time. But in that specific time frame or the people that were there, it seemed like it was everybody, Right. But again, we're going back thousands and thousands and thousands of years and not too far from the creation of Adam and Eve. So it was few, but it was enough to really make an impact, just to say the least. Okay. So there was a departure from righteousness and God saw the wickedness of man was continually great and he was continually evil. In other words, he did not repent. And also people will doubt the promise of the second coming of Jesus the same way. Verse 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4 says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking with after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Or Jesus ain't came back just yet, right? For since the fathers fell asleep, our ancestors or the ancient Hebrew ancestors, right? All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So this is also very, very important um, context to also understand as well, because when we think about from creation and what the verse is actually saying, it really goes back to what King Solomon um, said, um, vanity, oh vanity, in regards to how he saw the world, all this vanity, or what's the purpose of all the stuff? What's the purpose? And he was a rich man, very, very extremely wealthy. He thought Mansa Musa was doing something. King Solomon was, was, you know, really, 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 really serious in this wealth. He basically had everything in his fingertips, but he was still, um, before he got in, you know, got in, in trouble with a Moabite uh, woman, he really had tremendous, tremendous gift from God in regards to wisdom. He said, this is a lot, this is a lot, vanity. You know, I'm young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging for bread. I heard that from, you know, my, my father, David, all of this other type of stuff. But man, this it's, it's really purposeless. It seems like it's absurd until he had or understood the depths and revelation of God before he really departed from the faith in his latter years because of who he intermingled with. So the point is, is that what, what King Solomon was saying as, as a point is there's nothing new under the sun. It's just that the old world or the, the things that have happened in the past that we deem as old or as some would say bronze age mythology, whatever it is, um, that it's the same stuff, but it's new. I had a conversation with a young man today on my Facebook friends page or post, and she basically was saying, um, it was an AI picture of, um, you know, it was, it was a, it was not a real picture, but it was an AI picture that basically had a womb and basically saying that robots will incubate babies in the future. All right. And so, um, it was fiction, but of course, you know, people are always working on different types of things, but, um, basically the, um, my Facebook friend basically said that, you know, you can't replace the creator, what the intent of the creator is. And man is dabbling into things that, 
um, should not be. And basically, a gentleman came online, uh, online and basically was scoffing um, and mocking, basically saying that, well, you know, technology is much better than what your God XYZ did and how your God um, uh, murdered all of those people from in the past. Uh, and you're going to do it again after um, in the future by fire. If that if, if, if a person or a monarch or a king did the same thing in our day, I assure you that they would go to jail. Your God is unstable. Get me. Get me here. Unstable and unhinged. So the and he says with love and respectfully, your God. So I said, so you know me. I know you usually don't chime in, but I always like to make sure that I vehemently defend the faith. Um, especially um, because this young lady has, has uh, ministered at our church um, years ago, but I vehemently like to um, defend the faith, especially when it comes to scoffers, just to kind of illustrate to those that may be wavering in their faith of how um, a lot of times when people say certain things, they actually take people who are not as strong in their faith and they try to punch holes in it. So I basically saw on just clear display this particular verse in action, how things or how people would scoff at and say, well, your um, Jesus is not coming. Where is God? And it's not, um, where is God? And I'm in anguish. It's where's your God now? Your God, these all did these, all of these things. And if, you know, why would you follow somebody like that? And I was like, come on, um, sir, you, you shouldn't be arrogant and condescending like that, especially when it comes to somebody's faith. The way that you should have communicated is really talk about how, you know, technology and, and, and things of that nature could be a benefit and um, how there could be ethical questions as far as the abuse of that particular technology. Right. Because there's still evil geniuses. You know, you have Tuskegee experiments, you have eugenics, you have a lot of things that's going on out there. And while technology can help, it can also hurt. We could just see this online by looking at social media and people getting gaslighted, doxxed, all of these other things that are happening. But the point is, is that we're in this modern environment and it's 2024, but something on the, in the, on the inside of that person's heart still mirrors this scripture that was written 3,000 plus years ago in the Old Testament or 2,000 plus years ago in the New Testament, excuse me, correction there. So nothing has really changed. Why? Because the wickedness of man has not changed. Right. So with all of the things that he said, I basically summarized it to say that, um, first of all, God does not murder people. He gives them justice. And what's really unhinged and really what is um, unstable is allowing for evil to persist and it never get checked. You're creating an environment, a global environment of, of hedonistic um, behavior where there is no vision that people cast off restraint and sin has an insatiable appetite. And so what God did as a as a symbol and type of um, symbol and type of Christ, Noah was preaching basically the gospel of the Old Testament, saying you need to get into the ark of the safe. You need to get into the ark of safety. You need to repent. You need to change your ways. Right. And he already knew that there was going to be a lot of people that rejected the message, because after all, nothing didn't happen for all of these years. There's generations that have, um, you know, have lived and died. So again, they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Remember how the old scripture says, new scripture says they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage. So that goes back to Genesis where it talks about how the sons of God came into the um, daughters of men and made wives of them. So they too, hear me here. I hope y'all hear this. They too tried to justify um, unholy marriage and tried to make it right just because they were married. And I'm going to just leave it at that. It's the same stuff, but it is repeating itself. But we act like, we, especially when we have spiritual blinders over our eyes because of sin or because of not understanding the word or not being discipled, we believe that it's a new thing. But in reality, sin and all of its manifestations is very old. It just seems new. So just like Sin and our nature is old. Righteousness and love and salvation is also very old. So God gave an answer from the very beginning 
to the thing that has inflicted humans for all of this time, which is old sins resurfacing again. However, old salvation will also and has resurfaced again. Back then, it was the ark, the physical ark, which is a symbol and type of the ark of the covenant, which is a symbol and type of the ark of safety or our eternal Sabbath, which is resting in Jesus Christ and being clothed in righteousness, especially in a wicked world that we are in today. So I went back and forth with the individual, just basically seeing the light. But I also knew that um, the person was, really wasn't receiving what I'm saying. And so I just kicked the dust off, kept on moving, if you will, allow for the person to have um, the last word. But I wanted to make sure that the person understood that they had a very distorted view of who God really was. Basically saying that, you know, if a person is a stripper, if a person is um, adulterous, if a person is you know, um, steal tax money. I was like, well, Zacchaeus was taking everybody's money, tax money, but God delivered him. God also worked through Rahab so that Joshua's troop could get into Jericho. And that was the same lineage of Jesus Christ. So he also helped him out as well. Right? Right. As far as adulterers, didn't Jesus get down on hand and knee and lift up the woman who was caught in the midst of adultery and kept all those stones from coming towards her? And basically said, go and sin no more. So he, the individual, because they repressed the truth, because they studied their way into unrighteousness or unbelief. And that's the reason why it's so important for you to protect your eye gates and your ear gates. That um, he, they studied their way out of understanding the, the things of God. Which is the same way that Pharaoh hardened, or allowed, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Instead of him being receptive to the things of God, God basically took his influence off of the person. And whenever God, y'all need to hear this, whenever God says, okay, you got it, bruh. You got it, sis. Go ahead and go on with your bad self. You automatically start growing a hard heart. Automatically. That hard heart will then lead to atheism, agnosticism, anything else except for the God of the Bible, because God has said, never mind, unless he has mercy and revisits you a little bit later on. Sometimes he does it. A lot of times he does not. We, and we need to understand that. A lot of times we, he does not. So let's go ahead and go back to the verse the scripture, if you will. All right. So again, a departure of righteousness. And we also talked about this verse as well from last week, right? Many false teachers will arise denying the redemption that is found in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't really do that. Again, but there were false prophets among you, among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, as it is right now, right? Who privily shall bring damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reasons of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Okay. I'm just giving y'all a mental break from all of the election stuff right now, right? We're going to focus on the land. Also, many who have known the truth will depart from it. Now speaking the spirit expressly, then the latter times, hear this, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, lust, sexual sin, right? Doctrines of devils, twisting of scripture, speaking lies in hypocrisy, Acting one way in front of everybody behind closed doors, you're a totally different person. They don't even acknowledge it. Having their conscience seared, hardened heart, remember, with a hot iron. Now, when we talk about conscience seared, let me just paint a picture here. You thought that that curling iron during Easter, way back in the day, that grandmama and mama and them, I remember my mom used to do that with my sister. She used to take that iron, hot curling iron right off of the stove and go against my... <laughs> Oh, against my sister's hair, and I used to hear the snap, crackle, and pop. <laughs> and I used to see my sister do this. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so glad that I did not have hair like that. Or <laughs> didn't do that. Not at all, right? So that iron, or that hot comb, if you will, was, that's right, the sizzle, like crispy bacon. <laughs> that hot iron. So you can just imagine if that was heated. And I remember when the hot comb used to turn red. And then they would wait for it to cool off a little bit. And you could just smell it all throughout the house, right? 
And then, you know, some of y'all still have burn marks from way back in the day, right? It's healed now, of course. But I, I can remember how hot that was. And it's really not about the hot iron. It's about what the hot iron was sitting on, which was the eye of that oven. And remember how the eye of that oven turned a, a bright red? Okay, so we talk about seared with a hot iron. That hot iron is meant to take metal and melt it, melt it to a certain point to where you can't open it. It's almost like a soldering iron. It's like you take two pieces of metal and put it together, and then you take extreme amount of heat to bond those two things together. You could barely put it apart. In other words, there is no opening. So what we have today when people play um, and do not take their um, relationship with God seriously or they um, don't consider things of faith, they fall into that same condition, which is the hardening of the heart like Pharaoh, which yeah. is somebody who was open to the things of God. Now, the new religion today is um, is another sign. The new religion today, just like talked about last week, is Gnosticism. And ironically enough, the gentleman basically said, well, I never said that I was an atheist. Nobody called me an atheist. And I said, yes, you didn't say that you were, but I covered the other part of that, which is agnostic atheist, and which is still an atheist in the classical sense. And here's 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 the difference, right? See, a lot of times when people say that they are an atheist, it represents a lack of belief, or I just don't believe God. But nobody just doesn't come from out of the womb as an atheist. You have to repress the truth, and you have to repress, um, as it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through 28, you have to repress the truth intentionally and snuff out all of the things in your heart that are even receptive to the things of God in order for you to get to that point. So this young man was using science and technology, which there's nothing wrong with science and technology, but this particular gentleman also began to look at Gnosticism, which is G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is the religion of I don't know. And it is almost, so biblically speaking, whenever, and I told him this and I said, you know that even though you may be an agnostic atheist where you don't claim to know if there's a higher power or not, according to scripture, if God said there is no other God except for me, then that means, and it's, 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 it's harsh reality in our world, and it's very countercultural, but that means that the God of the Bible is the only God there is, according to scripture. So if you even think that there's something else, according to God's viewpoint, he sees you as an atheist because you lack belief in him. You could be mad at him. You could scoff all those other temper types of things. But when you don't even acknowledge the creator, it doesn't matter if you think that there's something else that still denies the one that is true in scripture. So he still follows in that category. So I shared the gospel with him and I preached a message, of course. And I, as expected, it was a rejection of it. But our job as Christians is, is that when we're faced with people that are um, that are entrenched in sin or entrenched in a mindset that is of the same nature that we see right here in the scriptures, right? Then we have to, again, move forward and keep on preaching the gospel, keep on sharing the love of Jesus Christ, because there's plenty of people who do and are open to it and have not had their hearts hardened because they pushed away at the table. Another way of looking at a hardened heart is the same way that God allows for a person to be excommunicated from the church. Excommunication means that you have now been removed from the hand of God or God has removed his hand from you and you're basically out there. Having that separation. So in reality, Pharaoh or other people who have had their hearts hardened because they have refused the things of God to the point of no return are really having hell on earth. And here's the reason why I use that phrase, because what is hell really about, along with the lake of fire and all that stuff, which is a part of that, it is separation from God. And when you're separated from God, you have no fellowship with him. Light has no fellowship with darkness. And it is a, and I told him, I was like, as a warning, I gave him a firm warning. I was like, it is a very dangerous place to be to where you can't even feel God or you can't even feel conviction any longer, right? 
You have to be mindful of that. So let's go back to the scriptures again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away of preachers, a falling away of teachers, people who want to follow different types of teachers that suit their own sensibilities, their own styles, their own mindset. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Let me help y'all. Let me help y'all people that be on the internet just too much. That is not talking about a past president or a current one. It's not talking about a person that could be. It's not a, it's not a woman, right? That man of sin be revealed or the son of perdition. That's talking about the antichrist. Now, the Antichrist spirit has been in the world for years. Ever since Jesus walked the earth in his bodily form, there has been an Antichrist spirit. In other words, anybody who came against Jesus had the Antichrist spirit. So that same spirit has been inside of the world for thousands and thousands of years. These are old, ancient spirits that we need to be mindful of. So that Antichrist spirit will then manifest into a person. And then that specific person will lead a large amount of people that, of course, receive a death blow and then they'll seemingly be resurrected from it. In other words, they'll have, they'll look like, walk like, talk like the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so you can understand why there will be strong delusion over the people that will behold this because they'll be like, that's the Messiah. When the Messiah is not going to come through denying what Jesus did, the Messiah will reaffirm what he already did in his first coming. Right. He'll, he'll reaffirm. He won't come as the lamb like he did the first time. He'll come like the lion the second time. This time around, this particular individual is coming like the goat. The goat and the lamb, they're two different things. Sheep on one side, goats on the other. Sheep represent the child of God. Goats represent the children of the devil. So this individual is going to come in the form of a goat. Remember, everything does things in parallels, right? In parallels. So again, see the sign. Next up, let's go ahead and go back into it again. So again, people will seek a religion that appeals to the flesh. I won't go through the entire thing, but you see how this part right here, at the, just look at the very top piece in letter D. People will seek a religion that appeals to the flesh. So let me help you all, right? When you see these memes on Facebook about Ouija boards, horoscopes, yes, I understand you got the tattoo on, on your ankle, but it's not of God, right? Looking at planets, um, burning sage in order to clean away evil spirits. Remember, in scripture, Jesus said that darkness can't cast out darkness, right? So what they do, what the evil spirits will do when you do all of that is that they'll just pause for a moment to have you think that they are <laughs> being pushed away, but in reality, they're entrenching you deeper and bringing you closer into their world, that invisible demonic world, okay? So all of those things that are out there that you see, tarot cards, a lot of things that, that you know, palm reading, a lot of those things that, were, um, that um, scripture actually forbids in Deuteronomy, soothsayers, fortune tellers, Miss Cleo, however you want to say it, those are things that the child of God should not partake in. And I remember seeing that meme just being publicized on Facebook. You could not imagine the amount of people that vehemently opposed such teaching like that. I mean, vehemently opposed that. In other words, it was offensive to them because they rather stay in the arms of the devil, as opposed to be exonerated by the things of God. And it all sums up to this thing right here, right? So again, they talk about highly high-minded, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of, of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, hedonism, more than lovers of themselves, more than lovers of God, have a form of godliness, but dying the power thereof from such turn away. Now that part where it says have a form of godliness, those are individuals that sound spiritual, but they deny that the God of the Bible is the power behind the things of the spirit. That's why agnosticism is the fastest growing religion 
or the higher power, or we don't know what it is, but we'll do the universe because that's something that, you know, I could kind of see it's untouchable. It's out there. And, you know, coincidence, random probability, all of those type of things, etc. But that is not true. We serve a living God. We serve a personal God. We also serve a God that gives second, third, or according to the math right here, 43,800 different chances for you. And I'm just being um, humorous there, but I, I want you to understand the seriousness and the tone of it. All of those chances to hear the right message. And that also lets you know that people can hear good things and still reject it. Can still hear good things and still reject it. So as it says in the verse, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, I'll just read it to you. For the time will come when they will not endure sound teaching from a sound church. But after their own lust, they shall heap themselves teachers or people who they want. See, you don't have to listen to a, a clip of Be Heard calling out false preachers and false teachers. As we study the scriptures, you should already know that. It should not be foreign. It should not be out of the ordinary for you to, as you study the scriptures and you hear righteous preaching, for you to be able to discern between what is true from what is false. But if you do, you need to go to a sound teacher, a sound preacher, so that we can search the scriptures to see if that particular doctrine that you may have heard on Facebook or from a friend, or maybe even something that you may believe on your own, to see if it truly aligns up with scripture. I saw this other young man who is the um, son of a very, very, very prominent um, spiritual leader here in Orlando, really um, take this one particular pastor to task over his view of how um, when you prophesy prosperity over a congregation, how that is not scripturally accurate because there's going to be a lot of people that are in that large congregation that are not going to be blessed monetarily or with any money. And the person was using scripture in order to justify it, right? But the reason why they were using scripture to justify it is because they heard from the person that they follow that it is correct, when in reality it is not. Now, in that particular case, it's more of discipleship and the person may not know any better. So you take time with that specific individual. However, if the person, despite being shown the truth, which they were shown the truth, they decide based off of their feelings and emotions to still go with the false teacher, then they still are illustrating what is happening um, um, com completely in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. They will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, or they would rather believe a lie instead of the actual So churches will be lukewarm, as we talked about on last week. World economic system will begin to come together, et cetera, et cetera. So this is where I wanted to talk about on this particular week as a quick review. So now we need to talk about the parable of the fig tree. Again, we have tender leaves, and we can see that it has changed, et cetera. So it's using a natural example to let us know how the world will be in the actual future. Not only that, let's also look at the next piece. Israel has chosen the tree that reigns over her. Now you know that in scripture, there was two trees, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then the tree of life. Notice what it says here. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me? They honor God and man and to go be promoted over other trees. And the tree said to the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness, my good fruit? In other words, it's enticement, right? Enticement to go or not be what it was created to be. Hopefully you follow that. Then said the trees unto the vine, come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man? and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, come now and reign over us. Then the bramble said unto the trees, if in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come from out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. In other words, this was a story about 
idol worship and going after things that are unlike God. Israel had a tough time when it came to idol worship back during at their moment in time. So in all of these examples, it's so ironic that a fig tree was chosen because we know in Genesis, there was leaves that were made from a fig tree that hid their shame. In the New Testament, we see Jesus curse a fig tree because it was not bearing fruit. Now, a lot of people were like, well, how is a fig tree going to bear fruit when it's in the dead of summer? Well, there's a certain type of fig tree that grows up in um in that part of the world that bears fruit year round. It's not seasonal like, okay, apple trees are going to only going to be on this particular season and then they're bare the rest. No, because then, you know, you could basically say, ah, oh, well, that's not really true. But there are a certain type of fig tree that blooms year round. So that fig tree represents the fruit of the spirit that we should display on a regular basis. And so when we get out of order and we don't do things in alignment with God, and start thinking that we should lord over others or find some other thing to do outside of what our calling or what our intended purpose is, then we start getting into trouble. And remember also that the book of Judges is a book to where you had three major themes. Um, the first theme was sin. The second theme was um, uh, punishment, then um, redemption, and then restoration. <laughs> then falling into sin, then it was punishment, redemption, and restoration. I wonder what phase we are in. Because there's a lot of people who believe that in two weeks, there's going to be great deliverance. Whoever you're voting for, there's going to be great deliverance that follows that. But I always ask the question, does this world deserve that? With everything that's going on and what things that we have been indulging in, especially as a nation. Do we deserve better or do we deserve really ultimate justice? I report, you decide, or maybe you don't have a decision. Maybe it's what God decides because he's the one who sets up kings and princes. Ah, I'll just leave that alone, leave it alone. So here is something that you also want to see that's also very interesting. Notice this, God has chosen three trees to represent Israel, right? Number one, the vine represents her spiritual privileges. So here's the interpretation of that specific verse along with staying away from idol worship. The vine represents spiritual privileges. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Next up. The vine represents her spiritual privileges. Again, it's talking about the vine. And we know in the New Testament, the vine is something that we should. I am the true vine. Ye are the branches. If you abide in me, I will also abide in you. If you cut off the root, then you're no longer abiding in Christ, so to speak, okay? So again, we need to understand that when we talk about abiding in Christ and the context of that, we need to understand that we need to continue to bear fruit regardless and do not be twisted up with the actual world. So let's keep on moving forward. Again, this is just for your reading and your leisure, just in a timely manner. Also with the fig tree, it also says, I will lay it waste and shall not be pruned nor dig, but there shall come up briars and thorns. Remember the, um, the different types of land that are a part of a person's heart, thorny ground, stony, stony ground, out into the wilderness, um, good fertile ground. Okay. So this is a call out to that. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he took for judgment, behold, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So again, the olive tree represents her religious privileges. Okay, so we have spiritual privileges, but also religious privileges. If thou were cut of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which shall be natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So this is also talking about how, as believers, we will be grafted in. Okay, so we have a privilege through Christ to be grafted in, but there's also a contrast to that when you are not grafted into the things of Christ. Where will you be? You will be cut off. 
And then, of course, the fig tree represents her natural privileges. So we have spiritual privileges, we have religious privileges, and also national privileges. So now in the morning, he has, as he has returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw the fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon. This is the one that we're most familiar with, right? And found nothing thereon, but leaves on it only. And said to it, let no fruit grow on the tree henceforward forever. Now, this particular fig tree should be bearing fruit year round. So that's the reason why it was so um, contrary to its nature because it, you know, it was not, it was supposed to be bearing fruit, but it wasn't. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? So again, we see these same fig trees that have been planted and I won't go into all of it. I'll just let it stay there on the screen so that you can come back on the actual video. But the main thing is, is that whenever we see fig trees inside of scripture, it is a sign of the spiritual condition of a believer, how we should consider spiritual privileges that God has afforded us. How should we be afforded to practice our faith religiously? And I'm not talking about fake religion. I'm talking about James 127 religion, the, the widows, the orphans, loving your neighbor as yourself, and also how you adore and worship God. And then, of course, national privileges, which basically are, okay, well, as a nation of God's people, we're supposed to be bearing fruit of the Spirit. So when God comes to inspect us and how we, how he looks at our lives, he doesn't do all of his inspection when you die, y'all. He looks at you all throughout your entire life. It's kind of like, okay, as a father, you mean to tell me I'm only going to show up right when you get ready to pass away? What about all of your life prior to that? As an involved father, we know that God is also involved with us. So he is with us along the way, whether we believe so or not. He is always watching over us and he's also examining us. Just like I examine my sons, or if I had daughters coming through the door to see if they're looking okay, if their mind is in the right place, etc. And, and I may not say anything because I see that things are in place. But if I see them acting out of care or not um, displaying the, the fruit of what my wife and I have taught that specific child, then there is going to be some level of scrutiny. There's going to be teaching. There's going to be leading. There's going to be guidance. And sometimes there's going to be punishment or there's going to be rebuke or reproof. So that is a part of that relationship. So Jesus was giving an illustration to those particular disciples that, hey, if you are part of me, then you should be productive in your life as an actual believer. That is so important. So when we look at Noah's time, Noah also had fig trees as well. And he also had a lineage as well during that specific time. We talk about Enoch. We talk about Methuselah. All of these individuals were um, also the um, elements of individuals that believed God, showed forth good fruit all the way up until the time of Noah. And that was a good way to measure time period. And also it says in Genesis 7, verse 6, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So he was very old and advanced in age at the time. Now remember, back at that time, which was really early in mankind's existence, there weren't all of the diseases that we had as of today. Scientists even say today that the human brain, by its design, is supposed to last like 3,000 years. But who knows what it would have been like if Adam and Eve would not have sinned in the garden. We would probably be in our... Um, pre-fallen uh, state, which is what God intended. But since that is not the case, we have to preach righteousness and we have to have salvation, not only of the physical body, but our spirit man instead. All right. So I'm coming around the mountain. Okay. Let me just keep on moving forward. So one little note about Methuselah. Methuselah was actually one of God's um, you know how like if you look at a watch and you see like there's different ticks on an actual watch? Okay. How there's like ticks on the watch and you see like the little dial, if you will. All right. So Methuselah was like an example or a time clock, if you will, to determine the start of the actual flood. So let's look at this really quickly. Right. So Methuselah was God's timepiece to determine the start of the flood. His long life shows God's long suffering. So here it says in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, when once long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So Methuselah was around for a long time, because remember, the evil didn't just start when, um, when Noah was born. 
this there was issues that was going on ever since Cain and Abel. So you have to talk, think about that, that the daughters of men weren't just innocent and just out there. They were willing participants in a lot of the debauchery, but there was a lot of things that were happening that were sinful prior to the actual flood. That's how it happened in the first place. So we're talking about from the time of Cain and Abel and and Cain and his family and all this other stuff and the spreading of people and the growth of the world, Tower of Babel, all that other stuff like that up until the time of Noah. So it was a very, very serious and treacherous time, if you will, in the earth realm. So as I come around the mountain, it's no wonder that Enoch walked with God after Methuselah was born. So after Methuselah was born, Enoch walked with God because in the spirit, it was already known that God was going to clean house. So God used people and those lives as a sign to the children of Israel and also a sign to Noah, who also knew about his um, ancestors that God was getting ready to make a major change in the world at that moment in time. Just because God allows certain things does not mean that he is aware of it. Just because God allows certain things doesn't mean that he's involved with it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, my mere presence will convict you because you know what you're supposed to be doing right as opposed to what is wrong. So again, God's particular timepiece as far as our current era, and this is also something as I come around the mountain here, is another parallel. So it's no longer the times of Noah, right? Right. But there's parallels that are even going on today in 2024, right? So Israel is God's timepiece to determine the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now we know that the current state of Israel, this is uh, now is the same current state of Israel back then. Israel back then was a secular nation that only had wicked kings. They didn't have any good kings. Right. Judah is the one that had good kings, but Israel represented the secular nation. And even today, Israel is still a secular nation. Israel, again, is God's timepiece to determine the second coming of Jesus Christ or this generation or genealogy, race or family. And again, God has been long suffering. So we know that from that time of Christ's first coming up until now is 2000 years. Right. 2,000 years. Now, we can't get calculations and say, okay, well, look here or look there. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, or he ain't going fast enough. If we're, you know, if God was so real, then why don't he save us right now? Okay, well, he is. It's called through the gospel. It's called through hearing preachers of righteousness. But as the verse goes on to say, but it's long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. So if you saw the parallel now that the intention of that verse now is the same message that was going on during the time of Noah back then. No difference. It's the same thing. And this is also an important um, note, even to a lot of preachers who are going through right now, because you believe that the people are not listening, especially those that are trying to do right. And keeping God's commandments, preaching the word in season or out of season. Um, as um, one of the team members said during our leadership meeting last night, that it's not going to get um, flowery and rosy in the times to come. It's going to get more and more difficult. However, there is still um, hope. There's still an arc of safety, and that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. So in this particular verse, we see the signs of the times, right? And I'll just go back right here. Behold a fig tree and lift your eyes to the eastern sky. And when these things become begin to come to pass, then look up. Amen. That was our message from this past Sunday. And lift up your hands, heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake them a parable. Behold a fig tree and all the trees. Now, when you see all of these parallels inside of scripture, there's a clue there. It's not telling you the timing, but it's telling you how to discern the times or how you can tell when the atmosphere is shifting spiritually in the earth realm. And I will tell you this, there has not been a time during my entire time in ministry. And I think that's been, um, 20 some odd years, 20 some odd years. I can actually say 20 years, right? So I can't not remember a time during my lifetime in ministry. And there's probably been other pastors who have been around much longer than I have where the spiritual climate is very perplexing. It's, it's, it's very 
um, dry and uneven right now. I will say that. I can't tell you how many times I've been waking up in the middle of the night just seeing people fighting in the spirit, um, seeing a lot of attacks and things of that nature and how the people of God need to pray. So here's what you need to know. In Jude 14 and 15, and I'm just going to summarize really quick right here, Enoch warns against, or Enoch once again warns of impending judgment. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, that's how they count time in scripture, prophesied of these saying, behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds where they which they have ungodly committed and all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him i can't tell you even inside of chat how many people i've seen that have blasphemed the lord's name have said all types of expletives and i'm not just talking about being expressive and saying you know whatever expletive jesus christ these people are actually saying harsh words towards Jesus Christ, almost using, trying to use wickedness and evil to make God, um, in their minds, do something, if you will. It's almost like I'm flinching at you. But humanity has been flinching against God for all of these years, right? And God is not moved by human emotion. He moves when he feels that his cup of um, wrath has came to the, to the brim. And when we get into the book of Revelation, we'll talk about that as well. So uh, Enoch, if he were to live in this time, he would have a word for every Christian. And that word is, it's time to walk with God without compromise. So as I close right here, Jesus is the ark that God has provided to save you from the coming judgment. This is the message. Neither is there salvation in any other, no other religion, y'all. It's hard to say that in our climate, but that doesn't mean it's less true because God would not make so many different paths to him. There may be several paths, as my, my pastor said, uh, my bishop said, there's many ways to Jesus, but there's only one way to God. You came to Jesus drunk, high, snorting cocaine, having illicit sex, whatever it may be, maybe in sexual sin, greed, lust, whatever. When Jesus found you, he didn't, a tax collector like Zacchaeus, caught in adultery like David, murdered a man like David, all these other different types of things. Jesus met you where you were. But God never did meet you where you were. <laughs> God can't meet you where you are. He sent his son to meet you where you are so that as a bridge between himself and mankind, you have salvation. Now you can go, boldly go before the throne of grace. So there's many ways to Jesus, but there's only one way to God. Broad is the way of destruction. Broad is the way of destruction. But narrow is the gate. When people are into Gnosticism and into this big giant interfaith umbrella type of religious system that people are starting to get into right now because you don't want to offend people or this big tent thing that's out there. I can't tell you how that is an exact sign of how broad destruction is because just think about it. If I'm trying to find something that's special, would I really make a large, wide way in order to be able to get to it? No, not at all. If I want something that is special, everybody can't come in in order to get to it. It has to be a narrow way. The reason why it's narrow is to let you know that the truth is not broad. The truth is, by its very nature, narrow, dogmatic, singular, uncompromising. So it can't be many ways to God. There's only one way to God. There's many ways to Jesus because Jesus met you where you were. But after you meet him, after you know him, he then diverts your attention and says, I am God. And besides him, there is none other. I met you where you were. I am interceding on your behalf. Now you have a relationship with the father. Now you could talk to the Father one-on-one -on -one because you have been clothed in righteousness. It's so important. And the Lord said unto Noah, come thou and all the house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So remember, people of God, Jesus is the door for you to enter in. He said in his word in John 10, 8, 
I am the door by me. If any man, men can enter, or if any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. In and out what? Live your life. Live your life. It didn't say perfect. It didn't say you're going to eat all the time. But once you are saved, you are saved. Genesis 7, 16, and they went in, male and female, on all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. This is also important here. I want to pull out my pen. I haven't pulled out the pen in a long time. Y'all see the parallel in this? You see the parallel in this? This is New Testament. This is Old Testament. Okay. God always uses established patterns in order to be able to, to get a point across. So as you can see right here, the Ark of Safety, Old Testament. The Ark of Safety in the New Testament. This one was physical. I'm just going to put physical. Okay. This one is physical. This one up here is spiritual. Okay. Forgive my handwriting. But the top one is spirit. The bottom one was physical. So again, when you see the parallels inside of scripture, look around you and you can see why it is so necessary for you to have a true and revelatory relationship with God. Let's move on. You also need to know that for every open door that God gives you, that no man can shut, that doesn't mean that God can't shut it. The door will soon shut and the judgment of God will begin to fall. In Luke 13, verse 25 through 28, it says, when, the, when once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door, and ye begin to stand without, or on the outside, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are, or I don't know you. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, say to you, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Iniquity basically means constant sin, never repenting, never saying, the Lord forgive me, etc. And then as a result of that, just like it was in the time of Noah, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth is not saying I'm sorry. It is, um, I never liked you anyway. And basically cursing God until their ending breath, right? When ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. So people will behold heaven and not have access to it. Can you imagine that? Having access and seeing heaven and seeing all of God's angels coming to earth, not to save you, which is what is going on right now, but to vanquish you because you have been deemed as wicked by the Lord. I don't know. <laughs> when I see Jesus, I want to go with him and then come back. I don't want to be here when Jesus comes back with all of the 10,000s of his saints and be on the wrong side of um, spiritual and eternal history. No, 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 no. Not at all. Not at all. And so... I think we're in a good place right now as we end. Again, the door stands open to you today. Remember, people of God, as I turn on my Lee Williams music, let me go ahead and get this on. I'll do something different right now. <laughs> I'll turn on Lee Williams. Let's live up. The ark is available to save you, and the door stands open to you today, and the Lord bids you to come. Remember that, people of God. I'm not just saying these things to try to scare anybody. None of those things at all. It's just an old school way of saying the following. No one knows how soon your door of opportunity will close and the judgment of God will begin to fall. I said this before, um, and I'll say it again. And of course, I'm open for questions as well. I felt certain things before the pandemic um, came. And this is as a preacher that had a lot of things going in the right direction right prior to the pandemic. But I believe that God had to purge a lot of foolishness that was going on in the church world during that time frame. And we really got a chance to see where our faith really lied. And you saw how there was a lot of individuals that were indiscriminately um, 
affected by what had happened, right? When judgment comes, it will not be indiscriminate based off of health or anything like that. It will be based off your spiritual condition as opposed to your physical condition, right? Because you could have passed away from COVID or something like that and still gone to heaven. But God always sends signs in the earth realm to let you know how, hey, this is a sign to you that you need to get right with God. And you saw how the world stood still for almost two years. Remember that three and a half year tribulation? You have, you have not seen anything yet, right? So this time around, why it seems like this preacher that you may not know of, that's not on um, TV, radio, or has thousands and thousands of members, not to say that any of those things are wrong, the message is still valid. The message is still valid. Take this opportunity to come to Jesus Christ before this world begins to start turning on its ear. I don't know what is gonna happen in the future, but I'll tell you the same thing that I felt prior to the pandemic and prior to a lot of things that have happened in the past that I do not know what's going on. I'm not gonna to prophesy to you at all because that's, that's not what God is speaking to me. But I will say to you, even at this very hour, that people need to get right with God. I don't know what's coming, but I feel like there's gonna be multiple attacks that's gonna be coming and before it gets better, it's going to get worse. So only the strong in faith will survive. Stay in the ark of Jesus Christ. Continue to believe. Continue to um, keep the faith as well. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope and pray that you enjoyed this message. Are there any questions at all? Any questions at all? All right. So if not, again, let this be your final message. Again. Door stands open to you today, and I'm admonishing you. I'm asking you, even as you guys share this message, pray prayerfully that you share this message on your wall um, so that people can hear it. People sometimes need to just hear some old school, old fashioned um, preaching in regards to the salvation for their souls. Again, if you enjoyed the message, please feel free to sow a seed or cash up us at dollar sign divine truth cc or simply go to our website at www.divinetruthcc.org. Well, Deacon Penn, I don't think that, um, that COVID will happen the same way, but there will be a lockdown in the future. The lockdown will be those that are saved and those that will not be saved. The lockdown will be those that believe on Jesus Christ and those that do not. The lockdown will be either you're going to worship the devil or you're going to worship God. The lockdown will be if you want to still work here, you can't go to church anymore and you can't have a relationship with Jesus Christ anymore. So now you have to make a decision, hard decisions between putting food on your table or following Jesus. Uncomfortable places, right? Right that people overseas have experienced, but now that's gonna to come to the affluent nations. I don't know when, I just feel that things are really going to come down to the wire. And it almost has to be so because the people of God have been too lax and they've gotten too comfortable. So the remnant has to rise, all right? God bless you, God keep you. This is my prayer. Again, share this message to your wall. Just click on the share button. That's right on here at the bottom of the actual um, Facebook page on our um, on this particular site, just click on the share button, share to your feed, and I hope and pray that someone will enjoy what the Lord has been saying at this time. Again, next week, we'll get into part two of this, of this Olivet Discourse, where we'll be talking about some really, really interesting things in regards to the things of God, all right? So part two is up and coming. Again, be blessed, everybody. Take care.